What I wanted to talk to you tonight a bit about is something that I've noticed covering politics these last couple of years. I think you definitely see it now in the US election um, with a, a candidate in Donald Trump who has completely smashed his way through anything that we assumed were the kind of social norms around things that are now a, a sort of sayable in politics. And I think it's a quite a good moment to reflect on the way that social media particularly is changing politics and, and what that might be doing actually at a fundamentally kind of technical social level. So my premise is that I think that using the internet in the way that communities form on the internet and social networks form on the internet actually makes us more inclined to extreme opinions. So there's very good research from this on uh, the Pew Research Institute which looks at lots of things related to the media and they found out that in the US very unfavourable views of the other party have more than doubled between 1992 and 2014. What that means is people are getting more partisan. Um, and actually you can see it in graph form. I mean, this is looking at how people of a certain political persuasion view people of the other political persuasion. And actually you can see going from 1994, it's, I mean, particularly among conservatives, uh, the way that they think about Democrats is incredibly now hostile. And I think this is really fascinating. We're actually looking at states where people are less happy to have their child marry somebody who supports another political party than they are them having married somebody of another race. You know, one of those traditional things that was a measure of kind of bigotry, really, is now actually how people feel. They feel so strongly politically aligned that they don't want their child to marry outside of that group. And that's, I think, a really kind of slightly concerning thing. One of the things that always gets said about politicians and has been for the last 10 years is that they're all the same. And I think this year in British politics has really proved that that's just fundamentally not true. Jeremy Corbyn's vision for Labour is very status, very socialist. Um, he's very pro-immigration. And Theresa May, on the other hand, for the Conservatives, is very anti-immigration. You're very hard line, very authoritarian. You know, these are two very, very different visions of Britain. And actually, those are only the two main party leaders. You know, we have other coalition of other parties are around that. Um, I think UKIP being the most obvious example that have, that have views that are very distinctive, very extreme you might say in some circumstances. So what's, uh, what's to blame for this tendency? Um, it is not sunshine, it is not moonlight, it is not good times, it isn't actually also boogie. Uh, it is, there is a good question that it is internet access itself that is making people more extreme. So uh, US researchers studied broadband rollout they cross-reference it with data on political beliefs, and they found that broadband internet increases partisan hostility. The more time people spent on the internet, the more partisan they were in their political beliefs. There's one of the suggestions, I'm sure, as with all of these things, there are many, many reasons. One of the suggestions for why that might be, oh, sorry, first of all, to say, Partisans discriminate against, against opposing partisans to a degree that exceeds discrimination based on race. So we're having a big conversation at the moment about whether Britain is becoming a more xenophobic society, whether America is becoming a white supremacist society. And actually what's happening as well is that people just are feeling even more viscerally than they feel about racial things that they feel about political beliefs. And one of the suggestions about why this might be, about why people might be getting more extreme and more uh, unwilling to, to compromise or listen to people with opposing views is about partisan media. This is one of my favourite pictures in the world. Someone went through and got all of the anchors at Fox News and it makes you feel like you're drunk because you're like, how many of that woman are you seeing? <laughs> um, but what we do is we have Fox News and uh, now I'd talk about um, internet-based outlets like Breitbart that are incredibly partisan. They exist to push uh, avowedly a partisan agenda and a particular view of the world. They make no pretense. I know Fox's slogan is, is fair and balanced, but I think even Fox thinks that's slightly trolling people by pretending that. And this happens uh, on the left as well. You know, there are very avowedly left-wing sites that see their primary job is to push a left-wing point of view rather than in any sense to kind of report any idea of objective truth. There is another possible explanation for why people might be getting more extreme. That is what I call the polo mint of polarisation. And it's a very good placeholder for what is a very interesting theory by Cass Sunstein, who is one of the co-authors of Nudge, which I don't know if you know is a very influential book about how you can make small changes translate into big differences in government policy. So one of the big uh, ones that's suggested there is if you paint a fly onto a urinal, it reduces spillage by a huge amount because men think they're really excited about the cost of chasing a fly down the plug hole and therefore they don't piss on the floor. Uh, so it's a very small change that for people who clean toilets, I imagine, has massive benefits. Um, and his other theory, um, which he's currently in the process of developing a, an internet version of it, is group polarisation theory. So what happens if they studied, for example, jury awards um, in negligence cases? So if people, they, they surveyed people before and after they made decisions, and actually if people were sort of slightly tending towards the idea that somebody had been negligent in a case, after they went into the jury room together, they found out that they were much more strongly of this opinion.
opinion. On the other hand, if they thought the other person was putting it on and maybe making it up to try and get some money out of an insurance company, put all of those people in the room together and they feel strongly this person should be taken away and shot. You know, people just, when they get into a group, they move towards the direction of where the gravity of the group is. So all the research shows if you take people who are opposed to the minimum wage, after talking to each other, they're still more opposed. People who tend to support gun control are likely, after discussion, to support gun control with considerable enthusiasm. People who believe that global warming is a serious problem are likely, after discussion, to insist on severe measures to prevent global warming. Um, so what you can do, what, the way that you can see it in jury awards is actually, if you put people together, ask them to name what, what, how much compensation they would get. Obviously, it's the US system where you're allowed to talk about juries. But you ask people what compensation level they would offer, and the num number they give individually is far, far lower than the amount that they would give after they talk to each other. So basically, people talk each other into a, a direction of travel. So how does that happen? How, does, how do groups form and how do groups polarise? So first of all, you get your homogenous group, your in-group, your cohesive group. Then people begin to twig where the kind of centre of gravity in that group is. Its ideological drift becomes clear. Doubters and halfway believers think, mm, I'm not really welcome here, I think I'll, I'll leave. The loudest people with the biggest opinions in the prevailing direction of travel talk up. That means that new members who join will be joined, perhaps they will, they will know the way that it's going, they will tend to be more extreme. And if the group segregates itself, that process only becomes more intense. And the result is a heavily polarised group. One of the reasons that this is so much more intense on the internet is because you, if you have a group on the internet, you are getting constant feedback. So, two things. This is the ISIS magazine, which is one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen in my life. It's really well designed, really well sub-edited. Who knows who in ISIS has that kind of level of journalism skills, but they do. Um, versus YouTube channels, communities that people... Are, I mean, Google is engaged in a battle about whether or not it should block access to these kind of things. Forums. And actually, internet forums studies of uh, jihadis have uh, found are much better at radicalising people because you're constantly engaged in the group, you're constantly getting the feedback. If you read the Beat magazine, yes, you might be getting some ISIS propaganda in front of you, but what you get from an ISIS forum is a constant reinforcement there are other people with this opinion and actually this is the kind of opinion that people have and a sense of community and belonging. Filter bubbles is the next important thing. This is a concept that was coined by uh, Eli Pariser uh, about the idea about what um, why particularly we might worry about group polarisation theory online because the whole way that the internet is structured, the architecture of it is about sort of forming us into tightly bound communities and there is not quite so much as you might get in everyday life of just that brownian motion of society that's what Ter uh, Terry Pratchett called it where you just bounce off people who are not very much like you and you actually have to kind of deal with them so there's this famous quote by Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, a squirrel dying in your front yard may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa. And everyone gasped with horror and then looked at their stats for their stories and found out that in fact people were much more interested in things that were happening very close to them than people dying in Africa. It is unfortunately, undeniably true that most of us are interested in people who are around us and actually are, are not constantly seeking out new information about people that we don't know about. Um, so I think that's something that we really have to think about, um, as is the fact that the way that the internet is structured, so that's how Facebook is structured, this is how Google is structured. Um, even if you're logged out, one engineer told me there are 57 signals that Google looks at, everything from what kind of computer you're on, to what kind of browser you're using, to where you're located, that it used to personally tailor your query results. And personalization on the internet is in some ways a wonderful thing. It makes sure that, you, you know, that when you put in a, a destination, it gives you the one that's close to you, not the one that's in Calgary or the one that's in Ontario. But what it also does is it makes assumptions about the kind of person you are. And actually there is research that suggests that, for example, Google autocomplete tips people's hands. They talk about the idea of, of, kind of Google as a kind of big brother giving you cigarettes. So, for example, they, there is a problem that if you type in women are into Google, there was a time when you would get very sexist suggestions. And that gives people the signal that that's the kind of pe thing that other people are thinking. And we're all very much social animals. And that feedback comes back to us. Never mind the fact that Google is quietly and visibly shaping the internet around how it, who it thinks you are already. And it's reducing that kind of serendipitous collision of people that you might not, or things that you might not expect to come into contact with. Um, so this is Eli Parasol's definition of a filter bubble. Your unique personal universe of information that you live in online why I think this is different to offline communications is that you can't see this. You absolutely can't see this. There's a really interesting thing that's happening at the moment with um, Facebook targeting of ads, YouTube targeting of ads in political campaigns. Now, YouTube's got a huge amount of knowledge about who you are. And what it might do is it might say, a political campaign might say, this I only want to serve to 50 to 65-year-old white voters in the north of England. 
And actually, you can then end up with campaign strategies where there is no kind of agreed national message. There is merely a series of messages that are tailored to individual people. In worst cases, I think they are tailored to individual groups' prejudices, but they don't ever get out into kind of the oxygen of society to be properly scrutinised. They're incredibly subterranean. One of the things that the Wall Street Journal runs that's really interesting if you want to have a look at it after this is this experiment called Blue Feed, Red Feed. Uh, and what they do is they take the same topics, I think they have a usual sample of things that get people going in America, so abortion, ISIS, gun control, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and they look at how differently they're represented on somebody who's maybe liked a lot of conservative pages on there, or somebody who's liked a lot of liberal pages on there. And you can find the conservative um, take on abortion is people, to, the Catholic priests talking about your soul being in grave danger, and the liberal version is, you know, 10 things we all know about my abortion, it's from a very sympathetic point of view. And what happens is that Facebook thinks it knows which one of those, and in fact probably does know which one of those you want to see. And it will give you more of stuff that you have already decided, it has already decided that you like. Even, I think, the most ideologically opinionated newspapers that we have have never really done that. There has always been some space for contrarian views, for a slight breadth of opinion. But this can become incredibly well targeted and incredibly reinforcing of things that you already believe. Even more scary than that are the, things, are, the are the pages on Facebook which are hyper-partisan and completely, completely do not care about facts at all. This graphic comes from a, a brilliant piece by John Herman in the New York Times when he looked into what he called Facebook's totally unintentional hyper-partisan political machine. And what happens is there are people who game essentially the Facebook algorithm. There is one guy he talks to who runs a pro-Trump site because that's the one that makes the money. Uh, and he gets two couple, he gets a couple up from the Philippines to rip stuff off from conservative websites, repost it on a page, and then games the Facebook algorithm to send people through to it. These are people who are using Facebook's architecture in order to essentially peddle disinformation. And even worse is that this never again sees the light of day. If there is something on the front cover of The Guardian or The Sun that you don't like, it's in your petrol station, it's in the, you know, it's in the cafe that you go to. It's something that happens as part of the national conversation that people can share an agreed set of facts and they can talk about. And on Facebook that just doesn't happen in the same way. And here's the interesting thing. Hillary Clinton did not do well on Facebook at all. Bernie Sanders did really well on Facebook. Jeremy Corbyn does extremely well on Facebook. But as the New York Times piece said, the especially engaged, largely oppositional left-wing page ecosystem, Hillary Clinton's message and cautious brand didn't carry. And that's something I think that maybe all of you will recognise from British politics where we are now, is that actually pragmatic, centrist, middle-of-the-road politics do not get anyone up in the morning. They do not get people out to rallies. Where all the energy is, where all the excitement is, is at the extremes. And partly that's fostered by an internet culture where the most loud voices proliferate and they're the ones that people are attracted to. They're the ones that make people feel passionate. They're the ones that people click share on because they want to perform that identity for others. They want to put on a badge on themselves that says, this is who I am and what I believe. And there is no point putting a badge on yourself that says, I'm kind of sensible. Not a very interesting kind of person. I just really hope the government sort of get on with stuff and, you know, don't really cause a fuss. No, that doesn't get anyone up in the morning. Um, so this is, the, this is the issue. And this is the issue about the way that online communities form is this idea called homophily, love of the same. It is the tendency of like-minded people to cluster together. We already know this happens in everyday life, as Jonathan Haidt saying, even so, if you can only want know one thing about a voter to predict their vote, zip code is the best predictor. Because, unsurprisingly, the stereotypes about Islingtonians are not totally ridiculous because people will see that a certain kind of place is full of people like them and they will want to live in a place that is full of people like them. Uh, but the same thing happens to a much, much greater extent with online communities which require far less investment. I mean, you don't have to buy a house to move into an online community. You know, you can just turn up somewhere that is full of people that you feel are like you. So this is, I think, a huge shift in a way that we construct our social identity that has happened over the last 10, 20 years. We've moved from primarily geographically based communities to identity based communities. In the old days, your social circle might have been the guys at your bowling club, you know, the guys at the Women's Institute, you know, the people who lived near you were pr your primary social circle. And I think for a lot of younger people, particularly, that just isn't true anymore. Their primary social circle might be their Facebook friends, their primary social circle might be all the other people who write Sherlock fan fiction with them on Tumblr. It might be all the people who hang out on the Donald Trump discussion forum. Those might be their primary social attachments. Rather than, in geography terms, you would just expect a much greater variety of types of people because we all just mix together. The people at your Women's Institute are likely, although they might come from the same class and background, to have a much broader range of views about a lot of different things than the people in your Donald Trump discussion forum. 
So that's where I think we've ended up. And I, this is my final question that I want to leave you with. Uh, for those of you who are on Twitter, how many people do you follow on Twitter who you regularly, profoundly disagree with? Because if it's not that many, then you have constructed a filter bubble for yourself and you are making yourself more extreme. And you might want to think about that, or you might decide, as I have, just mute everybody, because actually they're very annoying <laughs> and, and I don't really want to hear from other people. But be aware always of your biases and prejudices because the internet makes them invisible and that is why I think we're getting more extreme.